Hello. That was a section from my piece for guitar and pre-recorded sounds, Sarajevo Winter, played by Eric Schriefer. Here are a few words from the text in the score. Snow on the ground, bullet-ridden glass for windows, and a momentary stillness that mocks our longing for an end to the insanity and speaks only of what we have lost. Didn't we leave all of this behind 50 years ago? Let us dream and fly above the clouds in this brief moment for life and love and peace. The music has brought me to Buchenwald, the Beechwood, which was a concentration camp established by the Nazi regime here on the Ettersburg, about eight kilometers outside Weimar in the summer of 1937. It was one of the first and the largest of the concentration camps that were established on German soil. It acted as an internment camp for prisoners of war from all over Europe and the Soviet Union. It was also used to intern religious and political prisoners, the physically disabled and mentally ill, and various persecuted minorities, Jews and Roma, Jehovah's Witnesses. The prisoners were used as forced labour in local armaments factories and other war-oriented projects. A quarter of the prisoners died during the seven and a half years the camp was here, more than 50,000 individuals. Today, the remains of the site act as a memorial to all the victims. However, there's not much that remains of the camp itself beyond the foundation stones. Most of the buildings, including the prisoners' barracks, were demolished by the Soviets after they used them themselves for a few years after the war. Only the main gate, the crematorium, the hospital block, and two of the guard towers remain. This is a muster ground. Up to 20,000 prisoners were lined up here for the roll call every day at dawn and again in the evening after a long and exhausting day of forced labor. Any absence could be punishable by torture and death by hanging from the gallows while the remainder of the inmates watched. Having said all of that, the purpose of this episode is not to document all of the terrible things that occurred here. That will be impossible and will go beyond the remit of my inquiry. But I do want to think about what happened after the Second World War in the light of what occurred here and in many other similar locations during the Nazi era. The post-war period was a difficult one. Not only was there mourning for the millions of dead, and not only were many cities and towns left in rubble, including large swathes of Weimar where 1,800 people had perished in a single bombing raid in March 1945, but there was also the legacy of responsibility. Nazism had been barbarous, the epitome of absolute evil. Even worse than Buchenwald, there had been the death camps and the Holocaust, the genocide of the Jewish people, and all of these things together represented a dark blemish on what remained. Robert Holb said, The systematic nature of the annihilation and the recognition that these acts of mass murder were planned and carried out by a nation formerly considered among the most civilised on earth are factors that make the Holocaust remarkable and almost unfathomable. The nation had to start again with a clear felling of the woods. There had to be commitment that xenophobia and racism should never reoccur. And there had to be the understanding of how these things could have happened in the first place, so they could never happen again. The purpose of this episode in my inquiry is to explore how the Weimar tradition, and in particular the Weimar identity thesis, characterising the relationship between the human mind and nature, contributed to attempts at understanding what had happened, and to the gradual process of atonement and reconciliation. Unfortunately, these goals were not achieved by way of the work of Martin Heidegger. As I alluded previously, he demonstrated considerable reluctance to address what Jaspers called the moral and metaphysical guilt of those in whose name the horrors were enacted. Holler wrote that the phenomenologist merely sought to ignore the past and escape into a realm of existential concerns in linguistic play. But in contrast, there were others, including Theodore Adorno and his colleagues at the Frankfurt School, who sought to confront head-on the question of what had gone wrong. While phenomenology was sidelined in Germany, 
the most influential of the existential phenomenologist voices of the post-war period emerging in France, the Frankfurters' critical theory sought to tackle the issues that underpin the clear felling head-on. I should start by looking back to the origins of critical theory. Amid the instability of the Weimar Republic, and at the same time as Heidegger was appointed to his first position as professor at Marburg, the Institute for Social Research was formed at the Goethe University Frankfurt in 1923. It drew together a group of academics who shared Marx's distaste for the injustices of capitalism, but who were dissatisfied with how the Soviet system had distorted and also undermined the Marxist vision. They sought social justice by way of a different path that drew on other trains of thought, including Freudian psychoanalysis, and also the theories of sociology that had been developed by Max Weber, whereby the study of social development would employ an interpretive methodology rather than the purely empirical approach that had been advocated by the Viennese positivists. Adorno was not out of step with his fellow Frankfurters when he argued that both the interpretation and the actuality of social development is inseparable from matters pertaining to human cognition. Consequently, in developing an approach to cultural and social theory, he didn't shy away from the challenges posed by Kant's transcendental epistemology and the Weimar identity thesis, with an emphasis on dialectic reasoning as an intrinsic element of the unfolding social perspective. But he rejected Hegel's theory of sublation, and thereafter Marxism's reworking of Hegelian teleology that supposedly justified the historical inevitability of a resolution to the injustices of modern industrialised culture. Instead, he looked to the paradoxes revealed in the Enlightenment project that had replaced myth with an alternative mythological narrative blind to its own status as myth. I'll come back to this later. The Frankfurters' agenda pertaining to social justice was not one that drew much respect from the National Socialist government, and many of the figures involved at the Institute were forced to flee Germany after the events of 1933, mostly for the US. Adorno was still in his 20s when he'd become associated with the Frankfurt School, but still he was sufficiently implicated. He escaped to England in 1934 and thereafter settled in the US. But he knew what was going on back in the fatherland, the catastrophe that was going to occupy him for the rest of his days. Yvonne Sherratt described the core concern addressed in his 1944 book, The Dialectic of Enlightenment, as the phenomena of the decline of Western civilization into Nazism in Germany. After the war in 1949, after 15 years away, Adorno was able to return to Germany and to Frankfurt, along with many of his institute colleagues. Immediately they tried to pick up where they'd left off, with the seeds of a social theory that attempted to characterise what had gone wrong, how the remarkable achievements of German culture, from Luther to Goethe to Carnap and Wittgenstein, and from Bach to Liszt and Strauss and Berg, had descended to the barbarities of the Nazi regime, how the Weimar tradition had led to this. This is the camp gate, built by the inmates in 1937. It became the main watchtower looking down over the whole camp. There was a machine gun here that could reach any spot on the muster ground. The right wing held the offices of the commanding officer. The left wing contained the camp prison, the feared bunker. The clock on the tower is frozen at 3.15 p.m., the time the camp was liberated on the 11th of April, 1945. Adorno said it was impossible to write poetry or anything remotely artistic after the war. The ascetic qualitative could lead the observer only away from the history and its ethical demands. No longer could the pursuit of metaphysics ignore the moral. No longer could intellectual culture refute its responsibilities to shape cultural norms. And there was a colossal work to do. The heritage of the past had been smashed to smithereens and made superfluous. Gratschik interpreted Adorno as having argued that art and culture has almost ceased to exist, for impostors have taken their place. The music of Igor Stravinsky and Dmitri Shostakovich joins the writings of Heidegger and Jean-Paul Sartre in the category of high culture, yet despite this classification, they are no more valuable than horoscopes, Hollywood B-movies and neon lights. <laughs> 
Adorno was sensitive to these things. After all, he was a musician. He'd studied composition with Alban Berg and at one time considered a career as a concert pianist. But he'd seen how music aesthetics in the wake of the war and industrialization and globalization was being renewed by way of resort to the facile. It was being denied of meaning by society's commoditization of art. Adorno abhorred the dominance of the culture industry with its factory-like production of superficiality. He argued that, more than ever, society required an art that possessed profound meaning, that could offer revelations, and that could challenge all forms of complacency and conventional norms. Adorno argued that renewal by way of the commoditization of objects and social practices was causing exchange value to supersede all other values. Art as virtue was reforged as the entertainment industry. While an economist might regard such a phenomenon as inevitable, Adorno bewailed the destruction of culture as a result. The very value and meaning of life suffers when consumers make convention of buying lifestyle and self-identity. People too become commodities represented as exchange value. Ethics and aesthetics and all the virtues of humanity are relegated to the realm of the superfluous and futile. But there was worse. If high culture had been written off as triviality, and the overcoming of this triviality was being fashioned by way of triviality itself, then the same principle held true for matters of social justice. If the old metaphysics had been exposed as false myth, and the overcoming of this false myth had become false myth itself, then the values of the Enlightenment had been entirely lost. Over the years, the international school where I work has welcomed as guests several surviving inmates from Buchenwald who, as part of the process of reconciliation, have come to talk with students. These have always been emotional occasions. The humiliation forced upon those who were interned was barbaric, and there's no greater symbol of barbarism than this. This is the wrought iron gate to the Buchenwald concentration camp, in clear view of the muster ground. It bears the inscription, Jedem das Sein, to each his due, based on a legal maxim of ancient Rome. To those not of the superior race, degradation and annihilation. Recognising the utter bankruptcy of aspirations for social justice and the failure of dialectical reason as outlined by the Weimar tradition, Adorno courted grave misgivings about whether intellectual activity in and of itself could actually address matters pertaining to the human condition in a meaningful way. His work seemed to suggest the very impossibility of cultural progress. He admired the work of the Second Viennese School of Composers tremendously, including the music of Schoenberg and Webern, but he feared that their art was essentially empty. The valuing of culture as virtue meant nothing. In the context of the modern world and modern values, it achieved nothing and led to nothing. Sherratt said, The central aim of the Enlightenment goes hand in hand with a series of other aims, maturity, freedom, security, peace and progress, which depend on the attainment of knowledge and reason, all of which were important to Adorno. He was committed to the Enlightenment project and believed it should be worth rescuing, despite that which it had led to. However, he feared it was doomed to fail. Its inherent paradoxes made it a mere castle in the air. On top of all the other problems that needed to be encompassed, the post-war Germany that Adorno returned to was split. It was the frontier between Communist East and Liberal West. It had become the central theatre of the Cold War and the possibility of a Third World War, including nuclear annihilation. This was not what the Weimar tradition had dreamed of when it espoused of reconciliation, egalitarianism and respect for human integrity. Something had gone badly wrong that events could have led to repeated world wars, the barbarism of Nazism and the lunacy of the post-war standoff. Adorno, echoing the sentiments of Kant and Hegel, defined the failure of the Enlightenment project as lying with conceptual thinking itself. It failed because it was unable to reconcile the essential paradox inherent in the effort of striving for an overcoming of mythic thinking. Sherratt said, Enlightenment sees itself as having transcended myth, 
as having overcome myth's negative feature of animism, immaturity, domination, fear, barbarism and regression. According to Adorno, the entire self-conception of enlightenment is formed in opposition to myth. However, it had thereafter resorted, perhaps inevitably, to defining its own mythology, which in turn lacked an ability to critique its own difficulties with explaining the violence of nature, the terror of the contingent. Thus it was, the Enlightenment itself, that while manufacturing the illusion of freedom, found itself exercising violence to impose uniformity and homogenization by way of Nazi Germany, Stalinist post-war Weimar, and even more subtly, the culture industry imported from the US. Adorno's Dialectic of Enlightenment, written with fellow Frankfurter Horkheimer, even before their return to Germany, argued that the Enlightenment's conception of rationality, which had been initiated with an emancipatory role, had developed into an even grander form of social regulation than what it replaced. Hegelian absolutism had led to totalitarianism rather than freedom. Sherritt added to this, Adorno demonstrates that Enlightenment culture, though centralising the source of the rational and marginalising the source of the non-rational, actually thereby undermines itself. A narrow culture which focuses obsessively upon the rational undermines that very rationality. He argued that any paradigm of thought leading to an objective narrative of the world is going to lead to violence. In the case of the Nazi regime, these distortions and abnormalities were projected onto the persecuted scapegoats, the Jews and Roma and Jehovah's Witnesses. Even the dialectic of enlightenment, which falsely believed that achieving mastery over nature by way of rationality would be an emancipatory act, inevitably turned to hegemony to impose its vision of the objective. Thus its emancipation became the enslavement of others and thereafter the self. How Ulysses lingered with us, not hurrying scornfully by us, he'd many times recall, all will be shown you if you make your journey to our fields in the green sea. I've come back into Weimar and to the List House to look at one of two paintings by Friedrich Preller hung here. The artist lived in this house and used it as a studio before List moved in. He was also intrigued by classical themes. The painting shows Odysseus tied to the mast of his ship, so as to repel the call of the sirens. Their music is irresistible, yet he prevents himself from acquiescing with self-imposed constraints. Adorno was intrigued by this story too, and by what it revealed of the role of public intellectuals in handling dialectic truth. If the oarsmen, ordinary folk, have their ears plugged with wax and are never going to be able to hear the siren's song, then Odysseus is in a different situation altogether. His status has enabled him to hear the song, but he's allowed himself to do so only at the cost of being bound to the mast. Similarly, Adorno recognised that the power of critical theory dialectics and of art in general is dependent upon its hermeneutic separation from the practical concerns of life. Even if he can identify the underlying problems of modern society as lying in a false objectification of nature and lying in the essential refutation of the Weimar identity thesis, he remains powerless to be able to do anything about it. Theodore Adorno published his Negative Dialectics in 1966, summarising his critique of the failure of the Enlightenment project and his proposals for an antidote to the conformity prevalent in the modernist version of Enlightenment. He criticised on the one hand the non-dialectical philosophy of Husserl and its ability to account for the development of ideas, but he also refuted the power of the Hegelian account of rationality. He argued that the dialectics evident in social contradiction do not by themselves create resolution. He argued, as Nietzsche and many of those in the idealist tradition had argued before, that only art was able to reach beyond the limits found in all other forms of intellectual and social endeavour. Only art could reveal the paradoxes and contradictions prevalent in society and culture and act to resolve them. Adorno's final work, his aesthetic theory, was published posthumously in 1970. He argued that great art possessed a meaning to overcome the social conventionality that acquiesced to social fetishism.
whereby popular taste was titillated by trivial matters. Over and over again, Adorno decried the Johnny Spilt Aus tradition as a false myth, the invalidation of art and culture as virtue created by the culture industry. But in the case of this last work, he looked far beyond these frustrations. He set out to present an account of meta-aesthetics, examining the history and development of aesthetics and the metaphysics underpinning it. Sherratt said, Adorno deploys Freud's ideas about subjectivity, that is, about the essential nature of the human mind, to see what underlies the acquisition of knowledge. If the Marxist ascetic, as evoked by Brecht, had looked to arouse feelings of repression and alienation and revolutionary fervour, or as evoked by post-revolutionary Leninism or Trotskyism, had sought a mechanism for educating the proletariat, then Adorno emphasised a return to core tenets of the Enlightenment, incorporating the metaphysics of idealism and the Weimar identity thesis. He said, artworks detach themselves from the empirical world and bring forth another world, one opposed to the empirical world, as if this other world too were an autonomous entity. However, given the continual progression of ideas, the interpretation of ascetic concepts such as form and beauty requires repeated review. Adorno wrote that art must turn against itself in opposition to its own concept and thus become uncertain of itself right into its innermost fibre. Art is dying out by definition and always it must be revitalised and restored. Even the pursuit of art, such as playing Bach or Beethoven endlessly, can itself become empty. Art must continually be reinvented if it's not to become sterile and vacuous. Even the greatest tragedy must be renewed if it's not to become irony and satire. Always this process continues. It's at the heart of art. Adorno commented that by attacking what seemed to be its foundation throughout the whole of its tradition, art has been qualitatively transformed. It itself becomes qualitatively other. Without art, humanity would no longer possess qualitative experience at all. There will be no colours and timbres remaining. There will be no meaning, only lifeless objects existing in a vacuous cosmos that itself has no significance and that must resort to yet more triviality to us to hide from its own utter worthlessness. Without art, without aesthetics, without the qualitative, all is lost. Man becomes beast, and beast becomes a soldier armed with pistol and mortar, and concentration camp, and intercontinental missile, and with hydrogen bomb. To prevent another catastrophe, and to enable the efficacy of a renewed enlightenment project, Adorno argued that the renewal of culture as virtue was an imperative. But he conceded that the issue at stake is actually not whether the culture industry is privileging guitars above violins, or sentiments of naivety above those of intricacy, or rationalising justifications for popular or high art media. Pluralism was entirely compatible with idealism. Nevertheless, he insisted that any recourse to artificiality must by necessity affect language itself, and the meaning of language, and thereafter the inauthenticity of thought. Given that every sentence and every utterance in language acts to constrain thoughts, an acquaintance to culture that has been prepackaged in cellophane for mass consumption creates habits of minds that are themselves superficial and liable to afford the world and people within it a superficial status. Once again, Adorno asserted that only art as virtue motivates liberation from the restrictions of language and an aspiration for genuine truth content. It enables the individual to achieve autonomy and freedom by way of its privileging of intuitive, non-discursive knowledge, and which in turn elevates the mind above the conceptual manacles of any form of rationality. It must rise above the artificiality and inauthenticity. He said, only by virtue of separation from empirical reality, which sanctions art to model the relationship of the whole and the part according to the work's own need, does the artwork achieve a heightened order of existence? This is the Buchenwald Camp Crematorium. There were no gas chambers here, but the site was used constantly to cremate the bodies of those who'd perished. There was an execution room in the cellar where more than a thousand inmates lost their lives. <laughs> 
At the side of the building are the dissection rooms, where dead bodies were plundered for gold fillings and other items of value, including sometimes their organs and skeletons. But hope for a better future beckons, and when all is said and done, according to Sherratt, there are many constructive elements in critical theory. She said, Adorno offers a way forwards. To rescue enlightenment entails broadening the foundational conception of what constitutes knowledge acquisition. Increasing the presence of aesthetic knowledge acquisition is a step towards this goal whereby the positive dialectic starts to become positive. It starts to rescue enlightenment from its internal decline to myth. Thanks for your patience in listening to thoughts pertaining to such a difficult context. If music points the way forwards, then here's another section from my piece for guitar and pre-recorded sounds, Sarajevo Winter which deals with similar themes to the Buchenwald Memorial, although in this case is a tribute to those who suffered in the Balkan War tragedy of the 1990s. Goodbye for now.